I'm going to show you the game between Peter Svidler and Magnus Carlsen from round eight, the penultimate round of the Grinka Chess Classic. If you want to subscribe to the channel, then do click on the link below. And if you want to support the channel, then do check out the links to PayPal and Patreon.com in the video description. So on with this game. Magnus Carlsen leading the tournament, of course, with two rounds to go, leading by a point. Two pretty tough games to conclude. Peter Svidler here and in the last round, Maxime Vachel Le Grave. So this, this is a very important game. And Svidler doesn't want to take on the Sveshnikov. He plays knight c3, doesn't want to play bishop b5. And he anticipated correctly that Carlsen would basically shut down the possibility of d4 with e5. This is a very solid way for black to play, just clamping in the center. But of course, the disadvantage is that it, well, concedes is perhaps too strong a word, but white can perhaps use the d5 square. Bishop c4. Now, naturally not knight f6, because then knight g5 will hit f7, so you have to play bishop e7 first. And d6. This has been played many, many times before. Is is a solid way for white to play, and it doesn't surprise me that Svidler chose this line. I just wanted to play something solid, uh, something very sound against Carlsen. You know, he has a, a good pawn structure here, for example. But it doesn't put that much pressure on black. And soon we're going to see that, well, Carlsen was playing this very, very quickly with black. This is well known. And, and the most popular moves here are bishop g4 to provoke f3 or simply to castle. They're both absolutely acceptable for black. But Carlsen very quickly played knight d7, and I can imagine this was part of his world championship preparation. It's a very good line for black. It seems to equalize very easily. Uh, this has been played previously by Kramnik, for example, and uh, Ivanchuk too. So because of the pressure here, then white exchanges. And now black recaptures with the A pawn. That's interesting. So well, if the queen are recaptured, then I guess the white is going to go in like this with the knight. But it's not so bad. I know this double pawn looks slightly odd, but it's not so bad. Uh, it can be useful to have the rook on the A file. But basically just these exchanges ease any congestion in black's position. By the way, moving the knight also frees this bishop. It can sometimes pop out to g5 to exchange off that dark squared bishop. c3 looks pretty normal, and castles, and knight e3. That, of course, was the point of this maneuver. Whoops, let's just get the arrow right. Point of this maneuver was to bring the knight to e3. So the knight can either come into d5 or f5. But bishop g5, this is a standard maneuver for this variation to get rid of this bad bishop on e7. And that also just kind of loosens white's control over d5. And here, um, it's possible just to take on e3 as in the game Lecco against Kramnik, Dortmund 2003, and, and Kramnik equalised very easily just by exchanging and playing the bishop to e6, like this. Black is just really solid here, really solid. There's, there's no real pressure on black's position. Normally, you know, to have the two bishops, of course, is something, but um, here, well, Really, white has to exchange bishops, and then it, it's absolutely nothing. So Carlson could have done that, but he plays 
to, to keep a little bit more juice in the position with King H8. And this has actually been played before. He thought for over 10 minutes on this move. Perhaps he was refreshing his memory. Um, just coming to terms with this position. But King H8 means that you know, he's perhaps getting ready to push the f pawn. Here, Anand against Ivanchuk went bishop d2 and went like this. And Ivanchuk also had no difficulties in this position, uh, followed by bishop e6. If knight d5, then you can exchange and play f5 with a very free game for black. Fiddle played a3, which I don't think makes a huge amount of difference to the position. It's also possible here just to exchange and play queen e7 and bishop e6 as Kramnik did. But Magnus just played f5. As Fiddler said afterwards, he found this rather unexpected. He didn't, I guess he didn't uh, anticipate that Carlson would be willing to give up this light squared bishop. So let's see what happened. Knight takes. Bishop takes, and Carlson took on f5. Now instead of recapturing the pawn immediately, he first pushed with d5. And Svidl put the bishop back on a2. Probably better to put the bishop on b3. It has the potential to come back and connect with the, the king side. But he played bishop a2. Rook takes f5. Not that this position is in any way worse for white. And queen g4 looks very natural. And the rook came back to f6. And here, well, if white puts the rook over to c to, from c to e1 with a little bit of pressure, this centre looks imposing. Actually, black has to keep tabs on the pawn on d5. And the, and the pawn on e5. Um, and although black's coordination is very good, you know, soon this rook will swing across. But in fact, I think, it, as I said, because of the, the slight pressure on these pawns, I think it's very difficult for black to make anything in this position. Of course, it's a very comfortable position for black, um, but white should be okay there. But instead, instead <laughs> Svidler thought for about 20 minutes in the position and he came up with an interesting little idea, but unfortunately for him, a flawed idea. He played f4. This was taken. Now, his idea was not to recapture. If white recaptures, then knight e5 and pawn here is going to be taken. But his idea was queen g5 to get at the pawn on d5. And if, for example, the knight comes back to defend, well, then we could perhaps take here. Uh, and the knight certainly doesn't look very good on e7. It's also possible just to swing the rook over to, to hit that knight for recapturing. But uh, Peter had overlooked uh, Magnus's next move, which was queen f8. If bishop takes d5, then rook f5 simply wins a piece. So Svidla had to play queen takes d5, but he really didn't want to do that because black now starts to gain control in the position with a rook d8. He came back to f3. In fact, he's probably still okay if he plays queen g5 here. With a funny idea, just giving up a pawn. And then switching the rook across. So why is this perhaps satisfactory for black? Uh, excuse me, for white rather, even though white is a, a pawn down. Well, dare I say it, it's about coordination. And actually white's major pieces coordinate extremely well. And you can see this bishop actually has a role in the game. Controlling key squares on the diagonal 
preventing Black's Rook shifting over to the e-file, for example, in some cases. Yes, it's an extra pawn, um, but also this knight doesn't get in the game. That's also a very important factor in the position. Can't switch across to the king side very easily. So white has, let, let's say, sufficient compensation here for the pawn. Very nicely coordinated pieces. Ted Fiddler just played the queen back to f3. Knight e5, and now that knight is swinging into white's position. Uh, here's another thing Svidler missed, was that queen e2, his first thought, and after this, rook d1, he'd simply overlooked that c4 could hold that knight in position, because bishop takes pawn is inadvisable because of the check and taking the bishop. So let's go back. So after knight e5, he was a bit stuck. He played queen e4, but then the knight swung around into g4. And after this move, knight e3. Well, we seem to have had repeating themes over the last few weeks. Well, one theme is the split rooks, and another is the octopus knight. And, well... The classic octopus knight is on d3, but I think this is certainly an honorary octopus on e3. We're basically blocking out white's rooks from the position, and that allows black the time to generate an attack on the king's side. I mean, that knight is just crippling, absolutely crippling. Attacks the rook, which has to move. Rook e8, so that queen getting knocked about. Magnus just decides to give up the pawn on b7 um, and just get on with the attack on the king's side. Again, it's, it's that, um, well, determination to, to push forward. You know, every move counts. Once he has the initiative, then he's not going to let it go. There's no hesitation with his attack. It's uh, very... It's a driving play. And this is a horrible position for white to defend. Black is just going to push forward on the king's side. My computer thinks that queen f3 is perhaps the best way to try to defend. But, I mean, this is an ugly position with all white's major pieces sort of locked in behind that knight. Um, queen h6... Keeps things going nicely. Um, maybe not f3. That might give white some defensive chances by giving up the queen. Even that's a little bit tricky. Um, in any case, it's a really unpleasant position for white. But Svidler just got very confused now. Uh, he was already running short of time. Magnus had, I don't know, like a 40 minute time advantage. Maybe even more. And uh, Peter Fiddler was down to his last few minutes by this stage. G4. No reason not to just keep going. And, and yeah, Peter's just shuffling. Queen H6. It's building up nicely. And now Rook F8. This is preparation for playing G4. So, for uh, play, excuse me, G3. So, for example... If, let's say, queen e5 looks very natural to pin the rook. But now g3 is absolutely crushing after takes knight g4. Hitting the queen, hitting the rook, preparing queen h2. Well, you can see this is... There are, I think there are many ways to win this position, but f3 is absolutely decisive. Threatening queen h1 mate and that pawn can't really be taken. So that's the threat, g3. And there is no decent defense. So for example, g3, we can take and take here. And I mean, this is absolutely hopeless. Svidler tried h3, but well, this was just his little joke at the end of the game. He constructed a checkmate by giving up a couple of pawns 
and allowing h2 check and g2 mate. There you go. As I always say, to allow a checkmate on the board, I think is the mark of a gentleman. And Peter took his defeat. Well, no one takes it well, but you know, as well as he could by allowing Magnus this uh, pretty checkmate. So there we go, Magnus Carlsen powers through and um, he's certainly guaranteed first place, first, equal first place in the tournament. I, actually, I'm recording this while uh, Fabiano Caruana is still playing his, his game in round eight. So I don't know whether he will uh, win that game. If he does, then Magnus is still only a point clear going into the final round. We'll have to see. But in any case, Magnus is just in imperious form at the moment and his live rating goes up to 28.71. Well, that is something special. Thanks very much for watching. Last round tomorrow.